On this evening's Nationwide, we mark the 60th anniversary of the Siege of Jadoville during Ireland's first ever international peacekeeping mission in the Congo. We meet some of the men who survived a battle against all the odds, an event that was the subject of a major film. And we look at a controversy about recognition of the men who survived that battle that lingers to this day. A time of innocence, a time that preceded the terrible events that were about to unfold for Irish troops in the Congo in the early 1960s. They had left Ireland for the country's first peacekeeping mission with a sense of excitement and adventure. Many were still teenagers and most had never been on a plane before. Bull's wool cloth and hobnail boots made up their uniforms. Appropriate dress for the African jungle would only come later. Some were brought to Dublin Zoo to see what kind of wild animals they might encounter. They even brought a pipe band. The band was to become part of a charm offensive. Still, these young men and boys acclimatised, settling into six months' tours of duty in an exotic new environment. Their average age was 18 and a half. One of the reasons uh, so many volunteered, we had um, just got a mundane type of lifestyle, and um, this is, here's an opportunity now we're all of training, maybe put into practice. I remember I getting a torch, some snappy underwear, and pyjamas. First time in the army, so I ever got an issue of pyjamas. Um, our equipment wasn't really suitable for overseas, but nobody said nothing. We still had our hobnail boots and our heavy uniforms and grey back shorts uh, going out. But uh, there was no complaints. Everybody just got on with the job. The briefing document was pretty uh, basic. Uh, we were told that they, we'd have to learn Swahili and we were given a book on Swahili. Of course, nobody told us that they all spoke French in, 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 uh, in the Congo. Or... On our arrival, we, we, um, we got general absolution. We all thought we were invincible. We had no advice, no training. I was just out of recruits about two months in San Mill. And uh, it, uh, we all thought we were going out to Burton's holiday camp. As I say, we thought it was just something different. My God, was it not. So why did the United Nations decide to intervene in the Congo conflict, seeking the involvement of Irish troops, 26 of whom were to die in that conflict, and are now commemorated here at the United Nations Veterans Association in Dublin? The UN role in the Congo was to stop Katanga becoming a failed state, to, to, to try and halt it becoming a failed state, because if it did become a failed state, it was very likely that the Soviet Union would come in and create Congo as a, a, you know, a puppet state. That was what was in the mind of the UN at the time and certainly what was in the mind of the, the Americans and the Western powers. The UN would have to be a third force. In the early 60s, African colonies fell one by one. One such colony was the Belgian Congo, which gained its independence in June 1960. The transition from colony to nationhood was disastrous and it was clear almost immediately the new government of Congo would never be a stable one. A military mutiny followed and Belgian troops were soon flying back to the Congo. The province of Katanga then decided to secede. That was a major political and economic problem. Katanga produced about one twelfth of the world's copper and, by some estimates, half of Congo's overall wealth. Belgian mining companies were more than anxious to retain their spoils and neither they nor the Katangese rebels wanted outside interference. Violence flared between the government and Katangese sides. Ireland was one of the countries approached for troops and it responded enthusiastically anxious to take its place among other nations. Within six months, however, the Irish army had seen the novel adventure of their mission quickly evaporate. On November 8, 1960, a platoon of 11 men from the 33rd Irish Battalion were ambushed at Niemba, reportedly being mistaken for foreign mercenaries by Baluba tribesmen. Eight of them endured a gruesome death and the word Baluba became a new word in the Irish lexicon. One of the three who managed to escape was Tom Kenny. I took my punishment, which was a fractured skull, two arrows in my body, one through my neck, backs of my legs dislocated, my arm dislocated, 
and about five o'clock in the morning I got up off the ground and I decided I'd walk back to camp. Now it's a hard thing to do with the blood streaming out of your head. I got muck and I plastered my head with muck, I plastered my arms with muck to stop the bleeding and away I went and it took me about 48 hours. I got half of the way back but I doubt if I would have been able to make the other half of it and fortunately for me there was a UN patrol in the district that picked me up and I'm here today to be able to talk about it. The subsequent funerals in Dublin revealed just how perilous the peacekeeping mission in a far-flung country had become. In September of 1961, a company of the 35th Irish Battalion was sent to a town called Jadoville to prevent unrest and violence. What happened there 60 years ago when some 150 men under the command of Commandant Pat Quinlan were besieged only really came to be recognised with the release of the movie The Siege of Jadoville. We are a country that has never owned or tried to conquer another sovereign nation. As a neutral country, Ireland has chosen to never be the aggressor. That's why they've asked for us. And if anybody thinks we're to be taken lightly, we'll show them that they are very sadly mistaken. Am I right, soldiers? Yes, sir! The question is always asked, why did A Company, who go to Jadaville and who sent them? It's right at the top. It's the UN Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, in conjunction with the Force Commander, uh, General Sean McKeown, the former Chief of Staff of the Irish Defence Forces, the two together uh, agree to send a company to Jadaville to placate the wishes of the Belgian Foreign Minister, Paul Henri Spack. Belgian, of course, being the former colonial power in the, in the area. The UN hugely underestimated the Katangis. Uh, the Indian commander in Elizabethville, Brigadier Raja, uh, saw the Katangis as simply a rabble. He thought they wouldn't fight back. And uh, the sense is the fighting will be over in a matter of hours. So it's within that context of the UN taking these huge decisions to end Katanga's secession that A Company's position in Jadaville becomes intolerable and they are attacked by the Katangis. The events at Jadaville involved poor communication, a level of political interference in a UN mission that would be highly unlikely today, and personality differences between Quinlan and other officers at HQ. Two of the men who took part in that battle were Noel Carey, a young lieutenant, and Ty Quinn, a junior non-commissioned officer. It was clear to them and others that Jadoville wasn't going to be a risk-free mission. And when we went in, then Pat Quinlan, uh, Commander Pat Quinlan went to the Burgermaster and he was told, get the hell out of here. He then inter had a, uh, an interview with a number of officials from Union Minier and they told him the same, get the hell out of, we don't want the UN here in Jadoville. He told the headquarters and we were told, stay there and all during the next week, that week, he was told, stay there, show the flag, all will be well. Pat Quinlan's decision to get his men digging trenches in which they could conceal themselves with camouflage was a critical one. Pat Quinlan insisted on digging trenches. Well, he had just to tell you once because we knew what was happening and we knew the safest place to be was going to be in a trench. After days of intimidation and skirmishes, the main attack by Belgian mercenaries and tribesmen came on a Sunday morning. Attack! Run to attack! Somebody get out here! By that time, the first burst of fire and I was in, obviously terrified where I was and then driving this, this uh, ambulance, which was the only vehicle I could drive, uh, back to the headquarters where Commodore Quinlan was. He was young lads, only 18 years of age. A good number of them were only 18. Some of them were actually younger, as we discovered afterwards. They'd never been under fire before. We had, with all the training and others, we, we would have simulated uh, firing overhead and things like that. But this was, this was the real thing. To everybody's credit, and certainly to the NCOs, uh, who gathered them, as I say, young lads with, with, with no experience, and were able to gather them together uh, after being hit out of the blue. I mean, totally unprovoked. 
It was no provocation. We hadn't attacked anybody. We had no intention of attacking anybody. We had no idea what was happening. And then all of a sudden, I could hear uh, shouting from my own platoon saying, we are under attack. And now that's where the film comes in, where you see them running across out of the bush. And same thing that we saw that Sunday, only this time we were under fire. And we returned the fire, and this lasted maybe an hour, two quarters of an hour, and eventually they turned and fled back into the bush. If we hadn't dug in that morning, the casualties would have been huge. The, the, only, only for being dug in, that, that saved us, certainly, uh, with regard to um, our lives, anyhow. That night was hazardous because, again, we, we hadn't practiced. It, it, w night warfare is different because you have different circumstances. There, there was a lot of jittery firing by our own. It was, the danger was somebody would shoot their own people. Food, ammunition and water were running short, but in the searing heat, water was perhaps the most critical problem. The food and water was a very big problem from the very start because when we went over, we didn't have enough rations. We had only a week's rations or something like that, and we were there for well over a week at this stage. Then came the airstrike. There's an almighty shout, get down, and people looking around, get down, somebody shouted. And this thing came flying out of the sun. That was the last thing we ever thought would happen. And it was the most scaring and difficult situation for us as commanders to try and get uh, the morale back, because we were just shattered. A number of attempts to relieve A Company failed, yet still they were told support was coming. We didn't tell the troops, we couldn't, because I mean, everything we were relying on, our relief. We were now starting to, you know, things were getting dicey. Uh, Food-wise, we had very little food. Uh, and uh, suddenly Pat Quinlan announced that all the water was gone. Noel Carey certainly felt the fear he had been unprepared for. Someone was praying for us because one of my platoon was shot in the chest and one inch more he was gone through his heart, the, the round. With little food or water left, Quinlan responded to a call from the local mayor to agree a ceasefire. For some, the fear of captivity was almost greater than that of battle. We knew that we had killed an awful lot of their people. And we knew that there was husbands or wives or whatever of some of the people that we killed going to be around there. Like, uh, I, I know to me, and I think anybody with anybody to come since, it was just a horrible waste of life. We thought that, you know, we were going to get killed one by one. But as it turned out, you know, it turned out fine. And In fact, while the men of A Company were afterwards held prisoner, they were treated humanely. What's your name? Uh, Sergeant uh, Jeremiah O'Driscoll of the Cora. From the Cora? Yeah, married in the Cora camp. And what do you miss most? I miss my wife and kids. And how are you doing for food? Uh, very good. We are very well treated here. Very much pleased with what we are being treated. And uh, we'll just keep our fingers crossed that uh, we get out of here. So why did A Company have only wounded casualties and no deaths? I think everyone got the impression, or I did anyway, that, you know, we have the measure of these fellas. We could deal with them. <laughs> the turned out was all right, but it could have got the other way as well. The first wave that came through that we actually visualised that would be about 75 to 100. And the numbers increased in after that. They had to move around. We didn't. That was a big advantage on our side. When you have a person out in the open and you're trying to set up a gun or something like that, you know, he's a sitting target and you take him out as fast as possible and that's it. The position we were in, which as I said previously, wasn't an ideal defensive position, but we had enough time to make a good defensive position out of it. That, if you're standing inside in a trench and there's nothing up just over your two shoulders in your head, you're a very small target. That was Pat Quinlan's idea, that get my men into trenches and we'll see what happens after that. That was his idea. It worked perfectly. At that time, post-traumatic stress was unheard of. Later, suicides and other issues were attributed to the experiences of some men at Jadoville and in other Congo battles. On their return to Ireland, some of them were taunted about having surrendered, about having given up too easily, and even about being guilty of cowardice. I never had it with the, we'd say, outside of the army. Okay. Or outside of the barracks even. Okay. Never had it. 
<coughs> this was kind of sniping from peers and yeah. others yeah. who may never have been in that kind of situation themselves. I never heard it from somebody who served overseas. Mm. It was always people that had never served overseas that, that came up with this. A veil suddenly came down that went from elation in Athlone and here a worship almost of Pat Quinlan to suddenly this veil started to descend. And in my case, I noticed it in the military college because some of the people who were at, at the headquarters were also instructors in the college or were involved in the college. You could not mention the word Jadaville. It was never mentioned. But you'd have to understand that we had a huge profile at the UN. After all these years, those taunts still rankle with some Congo veterans. Join us in part two when we'll hear why a campaign to achieve greater recognition for those who fought at Jadoville continues to this day. Well, he, you know, he, he felt very angry that uh, his men were not treated with the respect that they should have got, uh, that uh, he wrote letters, he had meetings with higher authority. He was chasing the medals with the 34 men that were recommended by his platoon commanders and himself. Uh, and for years he fought to get this recognition in the form of medals. And he was quite angry about it and very disappointed. You're very welcome back to Nationwide. 60 years on, there remains the legacy of what some describe as an injustice to those who survived the Battle of Jadoville. Many were recommended for bravery honours, but never received them. Four years ago, following an official report, the members of A Company received a special medal for their service at the siege. This was called the Baun Jadoville. The Baun, Irish for medal, bears the words valiant defence and courage. Also at that time, Commandant Pat Quinlan was awarded a posthumous medal for bravery. Some campaigners believe more, if not all, of the troops who took part deserve similar recognition. It was the coming of age for the Defence Forces as such. These brave men and many people afterwards forged the path for us in terms of peacekeeping with the United Nations. They went into a difficult part of the world, which was then the Congo, and they tried to bring peace and stability to an area that was in strife. I think that people generally feel disappointed and I feel that the sacrifice that these brave men made and uh, that we must remember that these people gave their lives in the service of peace, they feel that it hasn't been fully recognised by the state or the United Nations. These men were of their time. As I said, 61, it was a different world. It was the first time we deployed a force like that overseas. It's a place that I would never like to see again, not even as a visitor. No matter who you were or what you did, I personally feel it felt you were entitled to a medal. We got our own UN medal, but the bravery medal should be given for everybody with respect. It affected me mentally, and um, it's only when it's after when you look back and see what you went through. But uh, we got over it, and we adjusted the car as best we could. We saw what we saw. And some people say it's the best forgotten about. Leo Quinlan, Pat Quinlan's son, is himself a former army officer who has campaigned for greater recognition for the men his father and other officers recommended for those higher honours. We often wondered about it and uh, as was said in the Shannon a few years ago, it wasn't out of shame, it was out of hurt that they didn't speak about it. And uh, sometime late last year, the whole question of moral injury has arisen as distinct from post-traumatic stress. And moral injury is where uh, soldiers uh, go through very, some very traumatic experience and, are, and then are betrayed by higher authority, which is the Jadavil situation. It's put very well in a, a document written by somebody from the United States War College uh, as recent as a few months back in which they described that the fiasco that was uh, in the Congo in 1961 and the excellent uh, defence put up by uh, the men in Jadaville, A Company, that if too much publicity was given to A Company, it would only tarnish the reputation of the United Nations and the Irish Army. And consequently, according to this document, the Irish authorities uh, covered, or sorry, swept the Jadaville incident under the carpet for decades. Was that your father's experience? Is that what he relayed to you? Yes. Quite simply, yes. 
What did he say? Well, he, you know, he, he felt very angry that uh, his men were not treated with the respect that they should have got, uh, that uh, he wrote letters, he had meetings with higher authority, he was chasing the medals with the 34 men that were recommended by his platoon commanders and himself, uh, and for years he fought to get this recognition in the form of medals, and he was quite angry about it and very disappointed. Why did he believe that so many men were deserving of a medal for exceptional bravery? Well, he was there, I suppose. He observed it, and it wasn't just him that made that, uh, those recommendations. I know from the records that the various platoon commanders, they gathered together over a two or three day period. They went through everybody who should be recommended for and for what. So it wasn't just from the top of his head. It was the uh, various platoon commanders were involved as well. He revered his men. Uh, when he was uh, uh, dying in hospital in Galway, uh, some of the NCOs that were with him in Jadaville, now all retired, men in their 60s, maybe even 70s at the time, uh, they came in in their uh, UN barrettes and medals and lined up at the end of the bed, saluted him, number and name, and marched out. Uh, at his funeral, this NCO uh, introduced me to his wife and he said, so many years ago when we were leaving at Lone Barracks, he said, this lady was my girlfriend, I introduced her to your dad. And he turned to her and he said, young lady, don't worry, I'll bring him home to you. And he did. Uh, these men did something rather extraordinary. When you think about it, it was the largest battle that the Irish army has been involved in since the formation of the state on its own, left to their own devices without any support whatsoever coming through. And as other people have written, they fought the enemy to a standstill. The enemy requested a ceasefire. It suggested his father's new medal would be intended as a recognition of all who were at Jadouville. It's not a principle he's comfortable with. There is no provision in the Defence Force regulations where one medal is awarded for everybody. So it doesn't, it doesn't wash. Could it be accepted in that spirit, in your father's name? Not sure. Not sure. Let's cross that bridge when we come to it. For Noel Carey, having received the Bound Jadaville is sufficient recognition, and it's now time to move on. We have got uh, an honour which can't be just bestowed on any other unit the of the Jadav Bound Jadaville. That, that to me is is is, is a great honour, and my my my. Uh, my, my loyalty will be to my comrades, and I'm d d delighted we have that, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that, that award. For you personally, the Jadoville Medal is sufficient recognition? Sufficient recognition now, yeah. Leo Quinlan and others have now begun a High Court action to challenge the findings of the expert report. It now seems a judge will decide the final legacy of the siege of Jadoville.